To what end, Michael? Like I read about, you know, the, the, the notion that we need that we need to, you know, turn to plant based foods and insect based protein in the future and that, you know, meat production and all the cow methane are contributing to the degradation of the environment. But like what, what, what do you do you see this as a plan or just as a as a part of the globalist utopian ideologically blind stupidity? Because, I mean, there are, farmers do pollute. There is runoff from, from fertilizer. It does cause algal blooms, for example, in the water. And these are, these are problems. I don't think they're insurmountable problems. But you're pointing to something that's more malevolent and deeper and programmatic. And, and you know, we don't want to go there without, without questioning that presumption. I always think if you can explain it with stupidity, you don't have to explain it with malevolence. Well, as you know, that's a be careful with that one because sometimes we do have to go to malevolence. In this I know, case. I know, we do. Uh, yeah, and I, and I and I watch your show enough to know you know exactly why this is happening. And let's talk about this. If the Dutch farmers, let's take this as a premise, are the most efficient in the world, well, let's just say they're the second most efficient. Why would you knock them out of the saddle to get somebody else to produce the food? Where Indian farmers? I mean, who's going to produce this food in a much less efficient way that would create even more pollution? This is clearly about control. Also, there's something that you never hear in, in, uh, in, in any press that, uh, uh, in, in, that I've heard in the United States is the tri-state city. Tri-state city is this smart city that they're proposing to build between the tri-states are Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany. So this mega city, basically, uh, that would take up all this farmland in that area and which would uh, bring uh, huge amounts of more people into this area, right? So the tri-state city is something you don't hear much about, but that's another part of this plan. There was a fire about maybe 10 days ago. I went to it right after the, the next morning, and it's, it's at a picnic distribution center, which is, uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, an investment, $600 million into this picnic food distribution center from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, coincidentally, and it burned down, right? And so, you know, that brought a little, you know, raised some eyebrows. Why did that thing just burn down? There's many of them. I, I, there's others in Netherlands that are growing. But the bottom line is, is the Bill and Melinda, or Bill Gates, is buying up farmland, as you know, all over the place. I know. He is the biggest private landowner in the United States right now, and the land that he's buying up, he's taking out of food production. And it seems to be because he's obsessed about, about meat production, at, at least in part, doesn't believe that that's part of a sustainable future. And so, but, but I, I do share your, your skepticism. It's the same thing happens on the bloody energy front. It's like, well, Australia won't build coal-generating coal electrical plants, but they'll ship their bloody coal to China where they're going to build much dirtier plants. And the same thing applies to Canada. If we shut down our industry, energy industry, which our bloody, insane, narcissistic, delusional, traitorous prime minister thinks happens to think is a good idea and seems to be working as hard as he can to manage, all that's going to happen is that we're going to cede the ground to people like Putin, who we also turned into a radical enemy with his, with his hands on the control pump for Europe. I mean, I don't see how we could be stupider here in the West if we actually took courses in stupidity and tried as hard as we could. It's, it, we seem to be doing everything we can to break everything as rapidly as possible. And then I wonder, too, you know, is it has it got to the point where the people who think, you know, that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs and there's too many people on the planet think that this is some sort of like needles eye that we have to go through? all this mass starvation and death so that we end up with a sustainable population. I mean, Jesus Christ, that's a dim and grim scenario. But I, as you said, why would you take the Dutch farmers out of business when, when they're so unbelievably hyperproductive and efficient? It's just, it's not like there's too much food, especially not if we don't have farmers. If anything, I would be uh, trying to get a, a large agricultural institute here in Netherlands to teach other farmers how to be as efficient as Dutch farmers are, uh, we're replicate these farmers. You know, in Afghanistan, actually, many of the farmers coming over, I was out in the farms quite a lot, uh, were actually Dutch farmers uh, to teach Afghans how to do things better. Uh, but the bottom line is, as you can see, there is a huge, I watch you all the time, you know what's happening, there's a huge authoritarian uh, 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 the, the, the desire to have a one world order is clearly strong. And this isn't the first time it's happened. As you know, it's a constant in human behavior. And, and also, as a, as a, 
as somebody who studies the human psyche a lot, as you do, you realize pulling these farmers off of their traditional farms unroots them. It cuts their anchor, their boat anchor. They're going to be drifting, uh, you know, culturally. So that makes them much easier to, you can't control farmers. Well, that's why yeah, Stalin wanted yeah. to get rid of the farmers. You know, Stalin had to get rid of those farmers because farmers have a mind of their own. Same with Mao. You got to get rid of those farmers because they think for themselves. And likewise here, these Dutch farmers think for themselves. And so they're the bad guys. To me, they're the great guys. These are the yeah, me that too, man. To that's our yeah. backbone. They are our backbone. That's why I flew to Netherlands from Mexico. I mean, that's how important this is. Okay, so what have, you dis what have you discovered on the ground there? You've been talking to farmers. Tell us, first of all, tell us about how the protests were organized, what their scope is, and what the farmers, why the farmers are doing this and what they hope to accomplish. Well, the farmers, actually, the farmers in Netherlands are, are amazingly uh, cognizant of what's happening. Uh, many people that I talk with around the world don't realize, you know, these other things like the WEF, you know, WEF and these sorts of things. But the, the, the Dutch farmers are talking about it in detail. They're like, ah, oh, the nitrogen is nonsense, you know, and it's all about Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates is trying to do this and they'll go into great detail. They know exactly mm -hmm. what's happening. They're trying to take our land because of this, this, and that, and the other. And, you know, they, they know it. They're not just like in Panama, it's another story. Panama is just like, give us cheap gas, give us cheap cheese, you know, keep, you know, cheap this and cheap that, and we'll go home, right? They're easily satisfied. Not the Dutch farmers, they're more sophisticated. These are serious players here. And again, that's why I jumped on an airplane. If people like this are blocking streets around Netherlands and we got the German farmers joining up with them and saw it, they're blocking the border together. German and Dutch farmers, right? Polish farmers, you know, I love Poland. I spent two years there. Polish, Polish farmers are, are making videos in support of Dutch farmers. That's how much it, look, that started in Canada, jumped over to the United States. It's over here now. I mean, it's really growing. This courage is, is spreading. And so, uh, and, and you see Italian farmers, Spanish farmers, people are rising up. And the more they realize what's actually happening, because, you know, the man behind the curtain is the, is the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Of course, we're going to have to deal with China. But at this rate, look, if Germany falls from these energy issues, which is looking pretty likely at this point, China is going to peel off the rock too, right? As are we economically, right? So, oh, for uh, we'll, sure. Yeah, we cannot sustain. Together, we cannot. We cannot sustain the collapse of Germany. That's absolutely one hundred percent obvious. That would be an utter bloody catastrophe. If Germany collapses, EU is gone, right, for a while, right? And uh, and, and uh, I mean, the EU will probably dissolve. That's my guess. I don't know. We'll see when time unfolds. But obviously, that'll take our economies with it, and China, right, and Japan. And of course, Japan imports what. 60, 70%. All these island nations and island state like Hawaii that import, Hawaii, 90% of their food imported, right? All yeah, these, yeah. They are going to be in for a world of hurt. Uh, Japan imports most of its food. And, you know, some of these countries that I, I have to, uh, you know, I, and I kind of, uh, uh, I should say, maybe insulted uh, the French for a while years ago and saying, why are they de de defending all these small farmers all the time? Now I see the French wisdom, you know, <laughs> these uh -huh. small farmers, yeah, that resilience and these small, you know, when you go to France and you go to, I'm sure you've been to France yeah, and, and, yeah. and, you know, and, 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 and their small farmers everywhere provide a great deal of resilience, right? And that's why yeah. in Netherlands, if they, if they lose, these farmers are vital for that. They're as important as their army. I mean, uh, you know, without these farmers, you're somebody else's, uh, you're in somebody else's pocket, Bill Gates, the World Economic Forum.